an introduction to our series, this is most certainly true. During Martin Luther's ministry, he came to be very concerned about the lack of understanding of the scriptures and sacraments. Not only among the people in the church, but also among the clergy. In the 1520s, he had asked a few of his students and colleagues to write a handbook that would be used for teaching the faith to parents. His student, John Agricola, wrote one such catechism, but it was too long for Luther's taste. And there were some antimonian warnings within the text that Luther disapproved of theologically. So in 1529, after spending many hours visiting the parishes of Saxony, Luther decided to pen his own handbook. This is how the church ended up, ended up with the gem we call the small catechism. As I told some earlier, this has been my sister, my brother, through me, it's my family's catechism. It's in perfect shape. I don't know why it should be used. But... <laughs> in that document, Luther reordered the Catholic Catechism, putting the Ten Commandments first, followed by the Apostles' Creed and the Lord's Prayer. This was a purposeful, pur purposeful rearrangement as Luther sought to help Christians understand the movement from law to gospel to instruction on living the Christian life. This Lenten series, as I said, of Luther's monologues and worship, this is most certainly true, comes from the commentary Luther makes concerning the three articles of the Apostles' Creed. He explains eloquently and simply what each article means for us as believers. It ends it with an affirmation of truth, as the viewer saying, on this you can stake your life. The Reverend Jonathan Marshausen has taken Luther's thoughts and put them into dramatic monologues so that we might hear and meditate on the foundations of our Christian faith. May God richly bless your worship of our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave everything so that we might be saved from sin, death, and the devil. And I was, as I read that, I want to throw in a couple explanations before we get started. anti -Elmian. As he said, one of his students put in antinomian comments that he didn't agree with. Well, that is the view that Christians are released by grace from the obligation of observing the moral law. The old saying that it doesn't matter, I'm saved, anything goes. That is what antinomian means, that grace saves us no matter if we care or not. And Luther didn't agree with that. He said, we do have a part in this. And the other part he talked about was the Catholic order of catechism. The Catholic order, in their catechism, is the profession of faith, the Apostles' Creed, the celebration of the sacraments, the Ten Commandments, and then the Lord's Prayer. Luther said, no. We have to understand how to follow God. That's why he says the Ten Commandments are first. Because when you apply your life to follow those commandments, then the Apostles' Creed, which he lists second, will be your faith. <coughs> and then we learn to pray the Lord's Prayer. And then we understand the sacrament of holy baptism, confession, and the sacrament of the altar. So Luther was very, very adamant and very... Very studied. I, that's why I say I, I, I really enjoyed how Luther, Luther did this thing. The first reading this morning is from the 20th chapter of Exodus, beginning at the first verse, verses 1 through 21, found on page 60 in your Pew Bibles. Page 60. And after our introduction, this will be familiar. Verse 1 And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. 
You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. For the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the Sabbath day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall do not you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor, nor any foreign residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, so that you may live long in the land of the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. When the people saw the thunder and lightning, and heard the trumpet, and saw the mountain and smoke, they trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance and said to Moses, Speak to us yourself, and we will listen. But do not have God speak to us, for we will die. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. God has come to test us, so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. The people remained at a distance while Moses approached the thick darkness where God was. And in summary, God gave Israel the Ten Commandments after reminding them of his constant care and guidance, leading them out of slavery into the wilderness on their way to the Promised Land. In that moment, with the thunder and lightning, the people feared God and begged Moses to speak to them. Their fear was justified in the face of such a powerful God, the word of the Lord. Thanks. 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 Our second reading this morning is, uh, let's see, I'll get on the right page here. It's from Galatians chapter 5. Verses 13 to 15, found on page 946 of your pew Bible. Page 946, Galatians 5, starting at verse 15. Life by the Spirit. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. And the summary is the law gave to Moses on Mount Sinai it was impossible for sinful humans to fulfill. In trying to fulfill it, humanity became stuck in the letter of the law and <coughs> failed to understand the spirit of the law. The true fulfillment of the law was first shown to us in the person of Jesus Christ, who loved with a sacrificial love. As followers of Christ, we are called to love our neighbors and serve one another. This is the entirety of God's law. It is based in love, not in punishment. We have been free to perform such acts of love as Jesus did, so that the world may know his holy name. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Have an actual gospel reading this morning. We're we'll ready to go on. As they say, have a little bit of a flow, but it's all good. It's all good. As the monologue indicates, Martin Luther ordered the sections of the, his small catechism so that it reflected his theological understanding of how God's word comes to us, both law and gospel. The law is that which shows us our sin. It drives to the foot of the cross. It is all of the shoulds and oughts. We feel convicted in our consciences. Those things which we fail to do and those that we wish we hadn't done. The law that comes to us in the Ten Commandments is the basis for God's guidance in our life. 
The commandments give us parameters for loving God and one another. So that we might have joyful and fruitful lives in the midst of community. Luther knew that the old Adam hangs around our necks. The original sin that plagues our species and leads us to seek our own will rather than that of the Father. That is why Luther answered every question of what does this mean in his catechism with a response that begins, we are, fear, we are to fear and love God. He knew, he knew human nature very well. He struggled mightily with it himself. And Luther also knew that left to our own devices, we would always choose our way rather than God's way. Through baptism, however, we are given the gift of the Holy Spirit, which allows us to be better, to be able to fear and love God. Inherent in Luther's explanations to each commandment is a broader view of our Christian responsibility to our neighbor. In his expositions on 1 Peter, Luther once wrote, We exist for no other reason than to be of a help to our neighbor. This conviction of loving one's neighbor can be clearly seen in the depth and breadth of his, his explanations of each of the Ten Commandments. Monologue 1, the Ten Commandments. And these were made to be spoken from Luther himself. So this is Luther's speech. I've been called a heretic, a wild boar, even Satan himself. But I most tried to be his faithful, as a faithful father and pastor and teacher. I believe that is why God placed this calling before me, to write, to write this little book for fathers and mothers, for pastors and teachers. I am listed as the author, Dr. Martin Luther. But it's really just a simple exposition of the truth found in Scripture. Well, I'm going to share the background of the small catechism. Our evangelical congregations in Germany which had finally experienced some freedom from the oppression of the Roman Catholic Church, were under new tyranny, the tyranny of ignorance. We set out teams of parish visitors, two theologians and two lawyers in each group, to visit the congregations and to make assignment, assessment of the spiritual and social life they found. The situation was grim. Well, not perhaps by your standards today, but certainly in our view. Our congregations allowed pastors to marry, but some still chose not to marry, had living cooks. Private and public drunkenness alike were widespread. There was a shameful disregard for God's word and the sacraments. While one congregation had not celebrated the Lord's Supper in 18 months, the people had no knowledge whatsoever of Christian teaching. And unfortunately, many pastors were quite incompetent and unfit for teaching. Something had to be done. I was convinced by my friends to put my hand to a writing a catechism, a little book of questions and answers. The first thing I had to decide as I began this assignment was where to begin. I want to include the basic parts of Christian faith, including the Ten Commandments, the Apostles' Creed, and the Lord's Prayer. Things that have been included in previous catechisms. But which one came first? Some thought the Creed, since it presents the Gospel of Jesus. But I believe the law should precede it. So I began with the Ten Commandments. Christian life starts with the Ten Commandments. The commandments provide a mirror to Christian hearts and inform them of the true condition of the soul. Yes, the Ten Commandments show us our sin and expose us for who we really are. You shalls and you shall nots always seem to apply best to another person. Only when we're caught red-handed must we be confronted with them. In the explanation of the Ten Commandments, we see that they not only prohibit vile behavior, they also prescribe good conduct. In both cases, the commandments convict us of our miserable state. 
So best to start with the Ten Commandments. They help us break through the obscurity of sin and place the law's demands right into our lap. Only then can we be ready to hear the gospel of forgiveness. The law comes before the promises of God, before baptism and the Lord's Supper, before anything else. Thus a Christian's life begins with the Ten Commandments, but the commandments also shape the Christian life. The Ten Commandments not only serve as a mirror to the heart, pointing us to the gospel, but they describe life as God intends for us. A healthy, God-pleasing life, which the gospel will motivate us to live, to fear, love, and trust in God. This is the Christian aim. Everyone must have a God. That certainly, that certain something on which we depend for life. People who are allowed their money look to money to help them get whatever they need or care for them in times of trouble. Money then becomes their God. The Ten Commandments demand devotion to the one true God and instruct us to use His name as it is intended, to take time to hear His word. And since we must have neighbors, we should know how God intends for us to get along. Decent homes. Protection from harm, true friendships, faithful marriages, respect for property, and orderly communities. Dear friends, we must understand that there is a temporal and eternal punishment for those who disregard and disobey God's commands. But for those who live by faith in His Son, Jesus Christ, and who love and trust in Him, above all else, they enjoy grace and every blessing. Friends in Christ, this is most certainly true. So here we have the beginnings of our series on Luther. He was uh, <coughs> quite a guy. He lived, he lived a life just like us, but he had a different calling. I love that. You catch the part where he said they had visited congregations and found the situation grew. The people as well as the clergy had no knowledge of Christian teaching. Now to be clear, they probably knew a lot about the synodical teachings, what the church leaders wanted them to know. But it wasn't about scripture. I truly believe the same we found today as churches and church leaders push their own agendas. Trying to say that socially correct is, is truth, that politi politically correct in our world is something that God ordained. No. We find religions and churches dissecting the Bible to fit the word into the, into the world instead of changing the world to follow the Bible. As I said last week, is the Jesus we are making for ourselves going to be the same one that we find in heaven? No. As Luther says, he listened. He's listened to the author of the small catechism. But his catechism, his book of questions and answers is an exposition of words in scripture. It's all God's ideas. All God's words. Luther just, by the Spirit, put it into a form, into a, into a, into a system that people could understand easier. I don't know about you, but I believe Luther was definitely led by the Spirit. I believe that truly the saltiness in his faith proved to be good for him. His purpose was real. Remember that we talked about last week that the solidness is gone? Well, Luther worked on his solidness, his purpose. So to restate Luther's explanation of the law, the three uses of the commandments of our, in our lives, and I'm a confirmation kids have heard this a hundred times. A curb to stop us from going too far. A mirror to show us our sin. 
and a guy to show us the right way for the God of prison life. I always imagine if all the world lived by God's standard. Wouldn't it be cool? Wouldn't it be cool if those Ten Commandments, those simple laws that everybody lived by? We wouldn't need prisons. We wouldn't need the law enforcement. Because people, as Luther said, as Peter said, that our main objective in life is to help others live a good life. But our sin takes that away from us. No, as they say, our God is so cool. He's more than we can ever understand. He wrote those commands before life was really even going in our, in our terms. But God had one, one, one purpose in life. He's put this on my heart real hard that way. What is God's purpose in life? What is his reason? His purpose in life is to get us back. His perfect creation that he created, the perfect people that he loved, that fell to sin. And this whole book is about him trying to get us back. Did you ever think of that? The whole Bible. It's about God trying to get us back from that fall that we did to say, hey, I know it, it happened. <clears throat> there had to be two sides. For people to say, why is there evil? If you're God, why did you let evil? Because there has to be two sides. Because if you don't know the opposites, you don't know what you have. <clears throat> so that's why God puts us through trials. So we know what the good things are. And as we read the other morning, other night in our, in our catechism, Adam and Eve made the fall. But what did the devil tell? Well, the only reason God doesn't want you to eat from that tree is because then you'll know good people. And the whole point was is they weren't ready for it. Adam and Eve weren't ready to handle the other side. But the other side got them. So ever since then, God has been trying, is trying and trying to show us and guide us back again and say, hey, quit following that serpent. Follow me. As I've said before, that much of the Bible is God himself telling us everything we know. As our reading said, the people said, Moses, you talk to us because we're scared of God. We can't, we'll surely die if he talks to us. Yeah. Their sin had them so scared of the truth that they didn't want to talk to God. But they talked to man. And what did God do? He said, man. He said, his son. And said, okay, now if you really think that talking to a man is going to solve this problem, I'll do that. I'll send my son. Unfortunately, they didn't solve the problem. So Jesus said, Dad, I don't think we're going to get through these people, so let's set the spirit in our hearts. Let's, let's work on them one, one, one more way. No. He tried to write them two tablets of stone. This is how you do it. Ten commandments. You follow these and you'll live life forever. We didn't do it. He said, his son, tell you what, this is how you live life. Watch him do it. And what do we do? And he went to a tree and said, we're bigger than him. And Jesus came off that tree. And he said, I'm bigger than you guys. And I'm never going to give up on you. Because dad says, we're going to get you back. I'm going to send something right in your heart that you cannot dissect, you can't tear it out of there. You might be able to push it down a little bit, but it's going to be it. I'm going to get you back. So, Luther truly understood that, that it's God's plan, it's God's way, it's God's rules. As he said, when we 
give up and follow his commands, then we'll understand the gospel. But we can't have the desert <laughs> before we go through the meal. Ah, trust in the Lord. He wants you back. He wants all of us back. We've got to spread that around. We've got to treat our neighbors to what we know. And, wow, to see how good they Ah, tell you what, let's see. Uh, dear Lord, we thank you for putting your spirit in the heart of He was one of your servants. He was one of your one of your people to guide us. A modern day apostle, if you will. But we must remember Luther said to look up. To look to God. Look, always look up. Don't let religion, don't let all that stuff get to you because that's not where it's at. Follow the word of the Lord. Otherwise, Matt will take it over and make it into whatever he wants to again. Heavenly Father, help us to follow you. Help us to look back at our at our history and see where it so so slowly happens that we start following man instead. Give us the solidness and zeal of, of someone like Luther to write it down and to tell people about it. To live to live what you ask us to live. Oh Lord, bless this congregation, bless our world. We thank you for these words. We thank you for those commands. Because we all know that they're perfect. They're perfect forever. Because that's how we live. Uh, Heavenly Father, we just pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Some prayers for our for our people, for our world. This is such an important time. Prayers to God. Oh, let us pray. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, your, your way, your nature, your, your plans are so perfect. And as I said, you saw you saw sin. You, you didn't make us robots. You know, we knew there'd have to be another side. What we saw as evil brought it into our faces before we were ready. Heavenly Father, we see that in our world now. We see evil becoming and getting our, our children's faces before they're ready. As a man spoke on the radio, our children are waking up in the morning not knowing who they are or what they are. They can't even look in the mirror and say, I am me. Because someone is telling them, you can't be sure. You have to question it all. Heavenly Father, your creation is perfect. You made us all perfect. But the sin is getting in our minds just like it did the Eve. Did God really say, or did God really make you, or did God really do? Heavenly Father, we're, we're seeing it, we're living it. Help us to come to you. Help us not to do what Adam and Eve did, hide in the garden, and pretend that you didn't know. Help us to come to you, to be healed and fixed. Help us to stop on that serpent's head and say, no more. We have a perfect life. Oh, Heavenly Father, thank you for your thank you for your mercy on us. Forgiving us for following the wrong way. And thank you for your grace looking past our mistakes. Not only Father, thank you for being our God. We worship and praise you for being the great I am. God, in your mercy. Oh, Lord Jesus, 
you you were the strongest human being, God, whatever. You came and stood and walked in the way of the Lord. You came and walked in the way of your Father and said, this is the way I will not follow anyone else. No matter what society or the religious people tried to do to you, you said, no, this is the way. Lord Jesus, we just praise you for being so strong, for giving us a, an example of how to, how to live. Lord Jesus, you are, you are our salvation. You tell us when we come to you that you will take us to your Father. Lord Jesus, continue to be our shepherd, continue to be our guide, continue to watch over us as we work to try to tell other people who you are. Oh, Lord Jesus, thank you for your love. Lord Jesus, in your mercy. And Father, Holy Spirit, you are what guides us. You are the, the salt in us. Help us to not push you down and hide you behind the ways of the world. Help us to listen. Help us to listen to our conscience. As it said, the ought to do's and the shouldn't do's and all those do's that we we fight with in our minds. Help us to know which ones come from you. Help us to see that if they don't fit in the commandments, that they didn't come from you. Holy Spirit, we just we just pray for your power. Holy Spirit, on this on this anniversary of 911. A day that we saw evil and what evil can do. Help us to always come to you when that evil happens and not, not get angry or want revenge, but to come for you for guidance. To come to you, come to you to help us to protect ourselves and to know when and where. Holy Spirit, be with all those that lost family and loved ones that lost that lost what they thought was the rest of their lives by losing someone in that top of those towers. Holy Spirit, now 21 years later, the thought seems to have failed and gotten weak. But help us to remember what those people did after it happened. They went to their churches and they went to you and they went to God and they said, we need help. Holy Spirit, fill up this community, fill up this church, fill up this world with your spirit to get us back to where we need to be. Following those Ten Commandments and understanding how a perfect life could be with ten simple rules. Oh, Holy Spirit, we, we ask you to take these prayers, prayers said and unsaid, those from my heart and from the people's heart here, we ask you to take him to our Father in heaven. We ask you to take him in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now let us share.